So while we're waiting for people to come in, I just want to say to you that um, one of the fun things about what I do is that, um, you know, I get to see behind the scenes in a lot of places. And I'm in a hotel room in San Francisco, um, great city, except what's with all these hills, right? Like, you know, I, you should see, I about slept on the sidewalk last night rather than trying to get back to my hotel. But um, so when you do media hits from places like hotel rooms, they want you to set them up in such a way that the bed isn't showing, which makes total All kinds of like tricks behind the trade um, that are funny to me because everything looks so beautifully polished and sounds so beautifully polished when it's happening um, when it's when you're in front of the cameras but you know literally you're sitting there talking with producers going wait wait can you can you pick that up and move it somewhere so um, so it's just kind of fun all right uh, let me get right down to questions since we got a bunch of people here sorry I fell asleep not really sorry I fell asleep uh, this whole time change always does me in and then when we had the uh, I'm three hours different than at home too. Um, and then I spent the morning with a dear friend, one of my very first students ever, way back in the 1980s, is a producer now here in San Francisco and I just did her radio show this morning and then we had lunch and I got tired so I fell asleep. All right, let me start here with the fact that today is an election day of course and um, uh, go vote. So if you have not voted and your family members have not voted, turn this off and go vote and take somebody who has not voted to the polls with you. And I'm not just sort of gonna leave that there. I'm gonna explain why that's important. And it's important for all the obvious reasons, you know, get your people in office, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll talk more about that today. But one of the things that I thought I might cover today are some of the really good points that people have made as I have talked to them across the country for the last several weeks. Some of the people with whom I was interviewing or some of the questions that people have asked that I felt needed better exploration. And one of the things that Tom Nichols, who was a conservative writer for The Atlantic, said um, in, in when we had a discussion at the JFK Library in Boston last week was that when he was a, a staunch Republican, they used to laugh at the Democrats because somehow he, he, he had a, some offensive name for it, but, which I don't recall, but the Democrats show up for presidential elections and nothing else. It was his take on it. Now, I don't think that's quite as true anymore as he, I think he was being a bit superlative on that in a, in a lot of ways, but the way that you build a movement is you put your people in every possible office and you can test every possible office um, because that's how you build a bench, that's how you get more and more people involved, and that's how you, um, you get your message out at every level and he said you know the the republicans in that era yes that tom um tom nichols and i'll tell you a little bit more about him in a minute but um um but um that idea of contesting every election and being there for every election really matters. So if you don't think it matters, think about the fact, for example, that one of the people who challenged the idea of gay marriages was a, an election, you know, I'm sorry, a, a local, um, a, lo a person who was locally elected. Probably people hadn't paid a lot of attention. And at every level, 
your voice matters. So it is a better example of why that matters in the present is the current Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, who is a Republican from Fayetteville, Louisiana, has never faced an opponent in, a, in an election. Now, that's not to say that an opponent might have beaten him, although they might have, one never knows, right? But because he never faced an opponent, there were never investigations into his totally bizarre finances. His podcast, which is a Christo-fascist podcast, his weird arrangements with his son about watching porn or monitoring each other's watching of porn. Um, um, there's, uh, um, there were all sorts of ways in which having an opponent and having people talking about an opponent might have stopped him much earlier than before he got to become the Speaker of the House of Representatives. But also, one of the things I always tell my, my graduate students, but I think it's actually a really good lesson for any person, and especially young people starting out in the world, is that when you apply for a job, and believe me, in academia, you apply for a lot of jobs that you are never going to get, um, by the numbers, by, by any, you know, Possible. And in terms of jobs or in terms of academia, on more than one occasion, like lots more than one occasion, I have been on a hiring committee or um, you know, somehow involved in the hiring process and somebody has come across my desk who was not okay for that particular job, but was really good for a different job or was really good for, um, for uh, uh, some kind of a book coming up. Or you know, in which case, having seen her application, I was able to say to an editor or to somebody else, hey, listen, I don't know this person myself, but boy, she's written a really impressive article on X. And that's kind of, um, I think, good for the job market, but it's also good for thinking about political discourse. That is, you don't have to win in order to have your ideas get heard. And again, maybe a majority won't like them at all. Um, and maybe you'll you know, your candidate's only going to win 30% of the vote or whatever, but more people will have heard them and will have questioned other ideas. So that's all to start by saying, um, get out and vote every time at every level. And similarly, um, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, I hope, um, uh, go to meetings, you know, go to student um, uh, uh Oh, certainly go to student performances and stuff, but go, I'm sorry, I'm still really groggy. Go to school committee meetings because and town office, uh, town meetings and, and city council meetings, because as you must know by now, if you've been following this on YouTube, what's happening is that um, people from out of town, from out of state are going to these meetings and shouting down the actual local actors. This is happening in Maine. And they're you know people get intimidated by that and they're not you know they're they are they are coming from away and they were trying to impose their views on a community and if there aren't people sticking up for the the student count i'm sorry the uh the student uh, the school the school committee or standing up for the town council people you know they get intimidated too and there are literally just sitting there makes a difference sitting there and speaking is better and if you are uncomfortable doing that or feel like that's not really your thing, literally just sitting there, putting bodies in chairs is a start. But if you're interested, there's an organization called Red Wine and Blue that gives you training sessions on how to feel comfortable speaking up in those settings and how you, your voice can be important there. And I really urge you, I'm a, I'm a very big fan of Red Wine and Blue. Um, Katy Paris uh, built it from nothing, and it's not about partisanship. It's about uh, basically women having their voice be heard. Although men are welcome, it's including a lot of people in politics who were not previously included, and that is, of course, how the 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 elections for the next few years are going to be decided is by people who previously didn't show up and are showing up now. All right, so let's start with that. If you haven't voted, turn off everything and um, go vote. And hi to Friendship Maine there. Um, 
just so you know, Buddy's uh, Buddy's mothers grew up in Friendship, and we still have a lot of a lot of people there, including one of my favorite of his cousins. All right. Um, so what you all what you all asked about was the poll that said that Biden is losing by what was it five points across or a bunch of points across five key states. Let's talk about polls. Polls are really interesting. Um, it, it have always been interesting. But right now we are almost a little less than a year out from the 2024 election. Polls are meaningless at this point. And, and think about things like if we had talked in, as we did actually in January of 2022 and tried to predict the future, we would not, at least I would not have foreseen the impact of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. I mean, that was a game changer, but we couldn't predict that even a month out. Lots of people thought that wasn't going to happen. And then in the midst of it, what was the obvious thing to happen when Putin invaded Ukraine? The obvious thing to happen would have been for Ukraine's government under Volodymyr Zelensky to have been flown to safety and been in a government in exile the same way, for example, that the Afghan government is now and became after the Taliban moved into to Afghanistan. But Zelensky didn't do that. Zelensky said, I don't need a ride. I need more ammunition. That was, how many words is that? Like under 10 words, I don't know, I'm not going to count them here in front of you and prove that I can't do numbers. But, but those words changed the entire global equation. And even if some of us could have, um, could have predicted the invasion, who would have predicted that Zelensky would have said, I don't need a ride, I need more ammunition, and said, we're staying here. We're not going to run away in the face of naked aggression. Um, those were game changers. So almost a year out is too early to know what's going to happen in an election in which the presumptive front runner for the Republicans is facing 91 counts of criminal behavior under four indictments. And that's not including the civil cases, which are deeply problematic for him, especially the one in Manhattan, where the Trump organization, former President Trump, his two oldest sons, uh, Don Jr. and Eric, and two members of the Trump organization, two employees of the Trump organization, have already been found liable for fraud. Okay, the judge has already made that determination. The case that is going forward now is trying to determine penalties. So the reason that that matters is that the potential penalties are losing the ability to do any kind of business in New York for a certain period of time. And it varies depending on, on what part of that we're looking at. That's the money base for the Trump organization. Now, how that's going to play out, I don't know. You asked me to predict how this is going to play out. I, I, I will talk more about the case in a minute. But my point for the polls is that it's too freaking early to tell anything. OK, but before we get to that, um, let, me, let me tell you two more things. If you're interested in polls nonetheless, um, follow a guy named Tom Bonnier. I actually wrote to him and asked how to pronounce his name so I could stop saying Tom, however you pronounce his last name. It's uh, it, uh, on social media, it's T B O N I E R. And I'm a huge fan of this guy, whom I don't know, by the way, um, because what he does is he takes polls like the one that, that has everybody upset. I think it was a New York Times Siena poll. And he actually does the cross tabs and says, for example, well, before the 2022 election, he said, well, this poll has, uh, you know, t like, takes a look at, I'm making this up, but let's say Virginia. I'm just making that up. And it says that, you know, the Republicans are going to win by this many, many people. But he would say, let's take a look at who is registered in that district. And, you know, and again, I'm making this up, but he would say, you know, there have been 94% of the new registrations in that district are women under 20. So for this to be true, 90% of them would have to vote for a Republican, which I don't believe is going to happen under Dobbs. And what I really like about the way he does stuff is that he does those the, the, the mixing of the polls 
to the actual voter registrations and the voter patterns in states. And he will say, I don't know what's going to happen. There are too many variables in this. Or he will say, it seems to me that this poll is off for these reasons. And he was one of the very few people to get 2022 right. And I remember reading him. That's actually when I found him was in 2022. And I remember reading him and thinking, man, he makes an awful lot of sense. Why is nobody paying attention to him? Because he kept saying, the numbers aren't adding up. These numbers are not okay. And I kept thinking, well, it sounds right to me what he's saying, but surely these people who are smarter than I am about numbers must be onto something. And then of course, it turned out Bonnier was right that, um, that there was no there there. And that brings up the other point about polls in this moment that really matters. And that is, as I have said repeatedly, um, we are in a moment in which people are trying to manipulate voters into giving up their democracy by portraying something that is not real. And that's, that's an actual political technique. It's, um, it's a political technique that's developed by a number of people. It's most famous coming from Russia, but there are obvious fingerprints of political politicos in the United States on those Russian um, um, documents. And what it says is that you can, you can create enough chaos in a political system that people will either give up on voting, believe that they have no agency, or they will vote to give up their own power. And that idea of creating a virtual political world is, uh, there's a number of ways to do that. And the, you know, there's the, the ones like running a candidate with a false name or running a candidate who switches sides or um, one of the ones that we've seen so much lately is um, uh, throwing so much stuff at people that like the, the old idea in the Cold War, for example, is you really limited the amount of information people could have and therefore they didn't know what they were doing and they, they you know, they, they kind of only had propaganda. You can do the opposite for a very similar result. That is throw so much crap at people all the time that they shut down. They don't know how to, they don't know how to answer. They, they lose the ability to discern what is right and what is wrong, what is real and what is not, and what they think about it. And they throw up their hands and they stop voting. And they say, whatever. Some people do that. Other people say, we need a strong man to sort this out for us. And um, one of the other key pieces of that is to keep disinformation coming, to make people constantly question what's under their feet. And I would put the flood of polls out there in that category. Now, that's not to say they're all inaccurate, and certainly a lot of pollsters are trying to do their very best, but those things get mixed in with the ones that are designed solely to change the way people think about stuff. So if if enough people think that an, that an election is a foregone conclusion, they don't show up to vote. Or they feel like they're the only people who believe something, and so they don't um, they don't dare speak up about it. And so at this point, any polls, I think, need to be approached with real skepticism because you don't know who's doing it for real and who is doing it to create spin. And there too, you saw that in 2022 where the polls had a red wave happening. And when the polls showed that, then the newspapers started talking about a red wave. And then everybody kept talking about how it wasn't how it wasn't whether the Democrats were going to lose control of everything. It was how badly they were going to lose. And some people had predictions of huge numbers that they were going to lose by. And there was this sort of it, this momentum where you could see people coming to believe something that really was not borne out on the on the ground. So before anybody freaks out about polling in this period, um, recognize that I think any information you get from anyone, and this includes me, you need to be skeptical of. You need to say, wait a minute, is this real? Or is this somebody trying to present something to me that is incorrect on purpose? Now, everybody makes mistakes. That's called um, misinformation. That's when you just make a mistake. Uh, I did that the other day. I, I actually wrote a lot of a letter based on an article that was a year old. It had been retweeted. Thank God my copy editor and I caught it, but 
I didn't do that on purpose and I would have corrected that. Disinformation is when I put that out there and I try and convince you that it's not true. Now, I tell you that I won't do that to you, but what if somebody hacks my, my Facebook? You should always have that in there that says, is this really happening? Is this really something that has some groundwork under it? And, um, and if not, uh, why not? Has Richardson been hacked? Has she decided that she's gonna, I don't know, work for the San Francisco City Authority to convince you to do something? Um, all of that skepticism is incredibly important in a period in which you are bombarded with things that are not true. So, um, so that's going to be true about uh, 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 a bunch of things. Now, people also ask about how polls are done. They all have different ways in which they do polling, and they do try and guard against the fact that they don't uh, they don't just use landlines. They try, and there are a lot of ways in which they try and safeguard. But polling is only as good as the model. Some of it's very good, some of it's not, and unfortunately, it's not always the same things that are good at the same time. And there's also a, a natural bias that goes into polling in the sense that, you know, I, I think back to the election of 1948, as one does, right, when um, pollsters were convinced that Dewey was going to win that election, not Truman, because they were white men. And the fact that Truman had gone to campaign in black neighborhoods really horrified a lot of white men. And so they just assumed that other voters would react the same way, and they didn't. That's Truman got reelected. But that was the first time in which polling, which was supposed to be like the answer to all political problems, they threw it all out and started again. There's a wonderful letter that night from Alistair Cook, who was doing his letters from America at the time, um, in which he, the, the pollsters were all like, well, I don't know. You know, we give up because we thought we knew everything a day ago, and now pff, they're tearing it up and going back to the drawing board. So don't freak out about polls. That is not, though, to say that you should stop worrying about the future, and I will talk more about that in just a second. All right, so um, again, if polls upset you, don't read them. Uh, there were polls that came out right after the New York Times Siena poll, if that's what it was, that upset everybody, that said the opposite. It had Biden winning everywhere. Maybe, maybe not. You know, again, it's also not a good idea to go with confirmation bias. Well, those polls must be wrong and these polls must be right. Um, I have to say the only poll I trust, and you can't have it, is I have a friend who has a gut sense for politics and she's always right. She's just always right. And she doesn't look at numbers. She doesn't do anything. I've no, she's like a sorcerer. I don't know. She's the person I trust. And, um, and there's nothing scientific behind that at all. But whenever I get upset, I call her and I say, is this really going to be OK? And she will say, yes, we're going to lose x, but we're going to win y and z and by a lot, and, and she's always right. All right, so now I wanna talk about some other things here that I think are really interesting and that tie into some of the things that you have asked about. So one of the questions that has come up for me lately is, you know, you have heard, and if you have not heard by now, you need to hear and pay attention to the fact that former President Donald Trump and the people who surround him have been very clear that if he is reelected in 2024, which they have every intention of doing everything they can to make happen right up to and including cheating, um, he is going to institute a military dictatorship. Um, and they have talked about gutting the civil service so that we will no longer have a nonpartisan civil service. Everybody will be loyal to Donald Trump. And that's important, not only because of what that means for the way work gets done, but also because think about the people that Trump surrounds himself with. Jeffrey Clark, for example, at the Department of Justice, or Chad Wolf in the Home, Department of Homeland Security, or um, Jenna Ellis, or her, his lawyer, or Rudy Giuliani, his lawyer, or, um, you know, just I could go through this whole list. These are not top flight people. Or um, um, Mike Pompeo, uh, who became Secretary of State. Compare him, who was a Christian nationalist, to um, Antony Blinken, who is Biden's Secretary of State. Speaks a number of languages, incredibly well studied, uh, knows incredible amounts of stuff, on and on and on, versus Pompeo, whose big claim to fame was that he was Christian. The problem with 
a, a partisan civil service is that the people who end up in the retinue of dictators are not good people. They're not, and I don't mean they're not personally good people either, but they're not smart people. They're not people who could make it on their own in a merit-based system. They are people who are there because of their loyalty to the kingpin. And that's, that's an important, a very important piece because what that means is that they recognize that if they are not loyal to the king or to the, the dictator, they, um, they will quite possibly go to jail, but they also will never enjoy that kind of power again. So look, for example, at Jeffrey Clark, who was in the Department of Justice under Donald Trump in the environmental division. Not a, I mean, it's, it was a good job, but he was not a headline guy. And because he was willing to sign on to the idea that the election was stolen, which it adamantly was not, Trump was willing to make him attorney general and make him attorney general in such a place where he actually had 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 been instrumental in keeping Trump in power. And when Trump ran this idea by his other appointees in the Department of Justice who actually had some credentials, they all said, we will resign en masse because this guy is useless. And I'm paraphrasing there, but they did have insulting things to say about him. In a, tw a second Trump term, they've already been clear that that same guy, Jeff Clark, would be quite high up in the Department of Justice. So that's one of the ways in which getting rid of the, of the nonpartisan civil service means you're not going to rise by merit, you're going to rise by loyalty, and that means you are fiercely loyal. You will do anything that dictator says because otherwise you're going to get kicked back down to wherever you were. They have talked then about using the Department of Justice in such a way that it enact, exacts revenge against people that Trump thought were insufficiently loyal. They have talked about using the military and there's great talk of course about how Trump um, said that the uh, then Joint Chiefs of Staff Mark Milley um, did something akin to treason which in the past would have been uh, punished by execution uh, because he was not sufficiently loyal to Donald Trump. I mean that was a huge huge statement because what that said was that the head of the strongest military in the world needed to be loyal not to the system as military leaders are the military has its long storied history and while in the United States we have tended um, to emphasize the places in which it has fallen short of those things in fact the 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 traditions of the military and the history of the military is something that military officers and enlisted uh, personnel take very seriously. And there are certainly bad apples, as there are in every um, organization, because humans got a human. But, um, but the fact that Trump wanted to get rid of that history and the military's loyalty to the Constitution and replace it with loyalty to himself should have, should have been an end of discussion right there, as far as I'm concerned. And, and as well as a number of members of the military were concerned as well. So he's done that. He's talked about revenge. Uh, certainly they've talked about gutting the, um, the uh, social safety net and replacing the government with, uh, with um, Christian laws that get rid of uh, any rights for LGBTQ plus people and women's rights, abortion rights, you know, all those things. So we know all those things are in place, right? But here's something that I asked um, Alexis Madrigal this morning on San Francisco radio and he had a when we were off the air and he had a really interesting answer to it and that's was I said to him and to my friend the producer I said why are they telling us this so if I were gonna take over the world um, become a dictator I would not go out and say vote for me I'm gonna be a dictator I would go out and say vote for me I'm all about you people I'm gonna you know be sweetness and light I'm gonna make things really great um, so so you know I'll be nice to everybody why would you go out and say we're gonna start a military dictatorship and Madrigal had a really interesting answer he said I think it's because Certainly was playing to his base, and I'll talk more about that. He's definitely playing to his base. But Madrigal went a little bit further, I think, and he said he's telling them they can be part of something. That this attempt to put Trump in office, which is pretty transparently an attempt to keep Trump out of prison, right, is not about Trump. It's about them that they will be the ones getting retribution against the people they hate through him.
It enables them to be part of something. It's not just you're voting for me, it's you are voting for this movement that's gonna crush all these other people, you are gonna be part of that. And I thought that was incredibly interesting because I think indeed he is playing to his base, but that idea that people wanna be part of something bigger I think points to something that I have been working on now for a long time. And that is the idea that there is another movement underway in this country. And that is the idea that in fact, we can be part of something bigger. That it's not about revenge, it's about redefining American democracy and re bringing back to life our the liberal democracy that has continually expanded with lots of backsliding and all that but is continually expanded through our society and that puts us in the same company as people like Fannie Lou Hamer and um, you know Wilma Mankiller and um, um, W.B. Du Bois and um, Abraham Lincoln and T Teddy Roosevelt and and you know and um, Julia Ward Howe, and, and we have the heroes on our side. If you're looking for the people that are on that side in the United States, you have neo-Nazis, you have enslavers, you have conspiracy theorists and anti-Semites like um, Father, uh, Father Coughlin, you have Huey Long, we're the ones who are trying to rebuild America at its greatest. So I thought that was really interesting when Madrigal said that because I think he's right. I think that Trump is inviting people to be part of this hate group, to hurt people. But there's a whole lot of the rest of us who also want to be part of something bigger that is big enough to encompass not only the country but the world. And that, I'm not saying that, it, that, that we're going to get everything because humans got a human, right? But that idea, I thought, and the fact that Trump, who reads people so well, has picked that up, I thought was really, really, really important. All right, so a couple more things. You asked about um, why is Trump so... Um, um, uh, in your face with the judge. Why is he confronting the judge in the Manhattan courtroom the way he is? And I, I want to reiterate, I'm not a lawyer. I, um, I read law and I read legal analysts and I can tell you what they say. But if you came to me to plan any legal defense, you would be scraping the bottom of the barrel because I don't, I just, I don't think that way. I don't, it's not, it's not even that I don't know the patterns. It's that I look at what happened, not at what's going to happen. So um, so what I am reading and what it certainly looks like to me, actually, it's not really what I'm reading, although it's, it's in the reading too, but this is a political question and you know I look at things as political questions. It looks pretty clear to me that Trump has given up trying to win um, his cases because they're pretty strongly against him. And in the case of the Manhattan courtroom, the judge has already decided that the Trump organization engaged in fraud and that the people who are charged in that case participated in it. That's done. It's a, it's a bench trial. And if you remember, the, the Trump lawyers did not ask for a jury trial. And, and there was a stuff when that happened, he started complaining that he wasn't allowed to have a jury
I saw the reports of the way he talked. He is incoherent. He can't put a sentence together. He is angry. And he comes across as one of those people who just believes that he is the king of everything and the world needs to um, to just do what he wants. And, you know, when he was younger, I, I get unpopular when I say this, but when he was younger, if you watch clips of him on late night TV, for example, when he was much younger, he was charming. I mean, it was not uh, the kind of charm that, that I ever found particularly attractive. It always seemed way terribly slick to me, but he was sharp and he was quick and he was audacious and he was kind of funny and and you could see people being like, oh, yeah, this is this is future. This is the 1980s, like 1990s. This is cool. He just now sounds like somebody who is angry, on you know, dis disconnected from reality. And one of the things I said to someone this morning is, when people talk about him winning in 2024, tell me which voters he's picked up because he lost 2016 he lost 2020 where has he picked up more voters now you will hear people talking nowadays about the fact that uh, biden has lost voters he's lost young voters he's lost black voters he's lost arab american voters he's lost you know they, they say all these things it's a year out um that those things you know people get very angry and they say well we're not voting for you and you're hearing that a lot for example from certain pockets of the arab american population and i understand their anger for sure but the alternative is a man who is literally saying he's going to throw the muslims out of america um if you choose in that case to withhold your vote for biden well maybe democracy should fall apart right because um that would just be you know cutting off your nose to spite your face so so i look at these things saying he's running strong and i think okay i don't know that he's not but tell me where he's picking up that many people because what i am seeing is people who were not previously engaged getting engaged against him because of his overreach in terms of military dictatorships that he's threatening and because of the dobbs decision all right, so um, so Lois, I'm going to ask that I just saw you go through. Um, so, and I have some more things here, but but the question here is, um, why do people think that he's the best they've ever seen, even though Biden is doing so much? And I think that's a complicated question. I really do, and I think it's a really interesting question. But I think a lot of it is. Um, I mean, they're the evangelicals who do think he's the best ever because of the Dobbs decision, which the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health in June of two, 20, excuse me, 2022 overturned the Roe versus Wade decision of 1973 that recognized abortion as a constitutional right. So they like that. But I think for a lot of people who aren't paying very close, first of all, aren't paying very close attention, they like the idea of Trump. And I certainly know a lot of Trumpers like that who just think he was strong and he was the country felt good under him because they have forgotten things like the pandemic and they weren't paying very close attention and they're not paying close attention now. And they liked that they felt like they didn't have to think about it. He was a rich white guy and they trusted him to do the right thing. I think there are those people. I also think there are the people who legitimately are just racists and sexists who want to get rid of him. And there are people who legitimately want to get rid of democracy. Um, so I think that, that those are the ones who will say he was great. And I hear that on, on occasion from people. He was great. And they won't hear anything else. And, you know, political scientists will tell you 20 to 30 percent of a reactionary of, of a population in a reactionary time will adhere to a reactionary leader and they will not hear anything different. And that's because in order to accept that that person is not the hero they thought he was, they have to admit that they were wrong all along. And that is psychologically incredibly difficult to say, hey, you guys were right. I should never have backed whomever um, because that person was really everything that you said. And you see this now, if you look at the never Trumpers, Tom Nichols being one of them, by the way, but if you look at um, Steve Schmidt, who himself is an interesting character, or George Conway, or the, the or um, uh, there's a lot of them. Um, they say, this is hard to do because your entire support network believes that person's good and you're the one saying no 
you're all wrong. I'm going to go out and I'm going to take a different path. And I'm going to say, yeah, those people were right. And you people were wrong. And you know who's really interesting on this is Mike Fanone, who was one of the guys who was at January 6th and ends up, ended up getting tasered and having a cardiac arrest because of it from the rioters. He was a Capitol Police officer. And he was um, has said that he voted for Trump in 2016, I think, 2020, I don't know, one or the other. And that you know, once this happened and that community turned against him, then he learned that there was this entire other community out there and is actually much beloved of them. Um, nice guy, normal guy, whatever. But it was just, all, you know, sort of having to meet a whole bunch of new people and change everything else. So I think there's a lot behind that as well. Uh, a couple more things here. Um, um, There's also, I think, an awful lot of um, um, of misogyny. I have never talked about that before, but one of the things that Trump represents to a lot of people is simply uh, patriarchy, simply having a, a strong man on top and, you know, that good old world from the 1950s. I hear that a lot. You know, the 1950s were so great, you know, that that this is the you only need one job to have a, a healthy family and all sorts of things. And every time I hear that, um, I, Without, because of the people I hear it from, I don't say, well, it wasn't so great for anybody who wasn't a white guy. But, um, but what I do say is, you are right. That would be great. Returning to a top tax bracket of 91% would be fabulous. And they always look at me like I've grown two heads and, and they sputter because the, the truth is that the reality that they remember is not at all what actually happened. So, but what they really like is that idea of feeling empowered again. And yes, everybody who said that to me has been an older white man. And that's, um, that I think is, is part of it. All right, some of the other things that you asked about um, that I'm watching. So um, you've asked about Project 2025. I've talked about that before. And just to say about that, it's in a thousand page document that outlines uh, a government under Trump or a Trump-like figure that does all the things that I have just said. It guts our government. It, it makes everybody loyal to a strong man. There is a philosophical idea behind that, the idea um, that we need to have an independent, um, uh, that the three branches of government need to be completely independent and therefore the president, the executive branch, should have no check on it from the legislative or the judicial branch. Um, that's uh, that's completely ahistorical from the very beginning. Since George Washington, he has recognized, he recognized that the legislative branch, Congress, and the judicial branch had oversight over the president. This is really just a power grab, but the Project 2025 is, is, is terrifying, and it is this blueprint for taking over American society. Um, so some of the other things here that you asked about, why are people against Biden? Why have they not? And why is the, somebody asked, why I call it the legacy media? Because um, sometimes reporting on foreign affairs, really hard to do better than David Rothkopf at the Daily Beast. Is the Daily Beast mainstream media? Maybe. And, and same thing if you're looking for, um, for legal, Slate and Dahlia Lithwick. I mean, you, literally, you just can't do any better than that. Or um, Ian Milheiser, Vox. So I just said Slate, Vox, and Daily Beast. Are they mainstream media? Well, they're not legacy media. And by legacy media, I mean media that's been around for a very long time. And that's not to say they don't have good stuff, too. I mean, I think Jennifer Rubin in the Washington Post is crackerjack good. I don't miss anything she writes. But you also get um, from legacy media deeply pro problematic takes, both in the way that they frame stories. And I have still not forgiven the New York Times for running with the story that Israel bombed that hospital in Gaza. That changed global politics. And even I, sitting there reading, because I read the same stuff they do um, when, it, when they're writing stories, um, I kept looking and going, the only evidence for this is coming from Hamas. You cannot take that 
as reality. And they ran with the story and, of course, got egg all over their faces because it turned out that's not what happened. But that was not okay. So I use legacy media because I don't know what to do about Vox and Slate and Daily Beast. And and obviously, the bulwark is fabulous. Um, and, and of course, everybody on Substack, Laura Rosen and um, Judd Legum and um, I'm not going to come up, uh, uh, Brian Kloss and uh, and you can't do without Joyce White Vance. And, you know, there's all these great voices, but how do you corral them any longer? So that's why I say that. But why are people not understanding what a great job that Biden is doing? And the the answer to that, I think, is very complicated. So the um, um, first of all, I, th I have said this before. I think that in the United States, after Watergate and Vietnam, people were incredibly uh, skeptical of the executive branch and to some degree Congress. But Congress is a little bit of a different story. And so it is, it is really dangerous, I think both professionally but also personally, to come out and say, I like that the president is doing X. Because by definition, there's going to be problems with it. Like, 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 for example, yesterday, the Biden administration announced an investment, and I don't remember how much, I think it was $16.4 I don't remember, but in Amtrak in the Eastern Corridor. Now, for somebody like me, oh my God, you know, that I cannot tell you, I, I, I hate to fly in the Eastern Corridor um, because everything always gets backed up. This is um, for, for um, since the George W. Bush administration, I haven't wanted to fly in the Eastern Corridor. I always take the, the, the train, or, or I used to take the train, now I take the bus because it's the only thing that's really reliable. If that train were really reliable, I would be on it all the time. So of course, for somebody like me, this is unbelievable. We know that 800,000 people take that train every day. There are 800,000 trips on it. There's a series of them. And, um, and that, that's a, that, that those people in that Eastern Corridor make up about 20% of our GDP. I mean, this is like, this is a really big deal. But come on, you know, $16.4 billion. Some of it's gonna be wasted. It just is. Somebody's going to do something stupid. Somebody's going to put the track on backward. I mean, you just know that there's going to be a problem. And somebody's going to say, oh, you were behind that. Well, there you go, Solandra, Solindra, whatever it was. That was a great example of part of an Obama initiative that was designed to permit somebody to fail. All of the companies succeeded except Solindra, which is the one you hear about, Solindra even though it was covered by all the other companies that in fact succeeded under that same program. So I think it's hard for people to come out and say, we think the government's doing a good job because somebody's always gonna say, well, what about? And also because I think there's also an emotional piece to that. If you come out in the, in the world and you say, hey, I really care about this, it makes you vulnerable to having people um, attack you. Whereas if you come out and say, yeah, they all suck, like, how are you going to undercut that? You're going to come up and say, well, no, I, I disagree. Some people are good. That, you know, I kind of think of it as the Nickelback syndrome, right? Like people who are, it's much easier to crap on Nickelback, which is a rock band for those of you who don't know, than it is for somebody to come out and say, yeah, I really like Nickelback because it's kind of the thing to just sort of jump on somebody. So I think there's also that emotional piece of it. But then I also think going on with, with Biden, is that, and this I tried to get at last night and what I wrote last night, is that governance is hard and governance is slightly boring often. So the whole thing I wrote about the stuff that the administration is doing in Latin America with countries in Latin America to try and stabilize the countries from which the, the majority of migration is coming to the United States southern border, that's not terribly news i mean it is newsworthy but it's not it's i mean if you read last night's letter you would know it wasn't a page turner um but it's incredibly important because migrations are incredibly important what the biden administration has said since the very first week he was in office is we are never going to solve this problem of migration in an era of climate change and especially in an era of um inequalities of wealth by putting up laws across the, the southern border. We need to do that too, and Biden has asked for those things, mostly um, money to 
put into the immigration courts so that they can process people a lot faster than they do now. It can take years to process uh, somebody who's applying for asylum in the United States, for example. But, but in order really to address this in a holistic way, we need to work with the countries from, whom these mig from which these migrants are coming and through which some of these migrants pass. And the way we're going to do that is by building facilities in those places so you can apply for asylum from those, those actual areas, and also by providing humanitarian and security and economic development aid. So we've put $2.1 billion into Latin American countries in the last two years to try and, and, and stabilize them to slow down immigration. That's really complicated. And not everybody's going to agree with it. And it takes a lot of time, and newsrooms uh, don't have a lot of money, so that people don't have a lot of time to write stories. And you know, they're they're always looking for the next story. And believe me, yesterday it would have been much easier, much easier, just to write a story about how Trump behaved in the courtroom, because there were other reporters there in the courtroom who were um, uh, tweeting out quotes from him. He was acting outrageously, it was a great story, but that much slower business of let's rebuild our ports, you know, that's really important because that's about supply chains and that's about jobs and that's about trade with other countries and that's about things like are going to be happening here in South, I'm sorry, wherever I am, uh, San Francisco this next week, starting on the 11th, the, the, the specific forum that's going to be here. These things are incredibly important. But they take a lot of digging, and you've got to know where they are. And then it's hard to write them in such a way that somebody's going to say, hey, I've got a great idea. Let's go pick up the newspaper so we can read about port development. So I think there is partly um, the fact that we have become accustomed. And one of the things that I cut out of last night's newsletter was the rise of politics as entertainment, as opposed to politics as governance. And politics as entertainment really began under Eisenhower, and, and Nixon's people in 68 turned it into the idea of appealing to people's emotions rather than appealing to their reason. And so I think it's a little harder to cover Biden and cover what he's doing, which is often dull compared to the fireworks that you're getting from Marjorie Taylor Greene. Or the attacks that you're getting on Biden, which are fast, pithy, and colorful. Now, that being said, you get people you get people get really upset about what they can do about this and about getting Biden better coverage. And mind you, I tend to cover Biden positively because I believe in the way he looks at the world. That's how I look at the world too. Um, and I, I, I actually think that the numbers bear out his investment in ordinary Americans. And I, my own bias is that I have never understood why we didn't invest more heavily in child and elder care. Because aside from the fact we all need that, when we everybody kept talking about rebuilding factories, which is just ducky, great, right? But, but we could actually inject tons of money into rural areas if we adequately funded child care and elder care because those, those can't be outsourced and they don't need factories. So that to me was always a real mismatch. So when, of course, when Biden talks about things like that, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I agree with that, I agree with that. Um, uh, but I tend to cover Biden positively because I agree with it. But more than that, I tend to cover him, I think, positively because I am interested in the history. I am not so much interested in this person screwed up. Like, like Bob Menendez is a Democrat in the Senate. He should have resigned years ago. I mean, I'm just absolutely incensed over the fact that somebody who's been sitting on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee appears to have had an untoward relationship with uh, Turkey. And, and he's not been convicted yet, but I don't care if that kind of a cloud is over you. You should not be on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which is the most important committee in the Senate. Now, he's not on it right now because according to the Democrats, if you are a part of the um, the Democratic conference and you're under if you're under indictment then you lose your committee seats but that's another question I'm much more interested I'm not interested in the flukes I'm much more interested in the larger patterns so I was always negative about the Trump administration because what I saw 
was the concentration of power among a very few unqualified people in ways that was des that were designed to to basically concentrate wealth. And so it's easier for me to say, well, you know, I will look the other way when um, some when some something screws up um, under the Biden administration than I would um, than perhaps a journalist would. So that's that's actually worth paying attention to here. But one of the things that um, that when you get upset about how people cover the media. But I want to emphasize here, I actually think one of the big mistakes that the Biden administration has made and is making is that it's trying to do everything for us. Like every time something comes up, the Biden administration runs out there and says, we can fix that. And they create an organization that is going to fix it. And God knows they're doing all kinds of stuff. Look at everything they're doing for uh, student loan forgiveness. And I actually quite like this, that when they were prevented from doing what they originally wanted to by the Republican Supreme Court, they simply said, okay, we're going to enforce the law as it exists. And because you people have been screwing over borrowers for all this time, just by reading the actual laws and, and enforcing the actual laws, we're going to, going to be able to excuse huge amounts of debt. And then, of course, we never heard about it. And one of the reasons that I wrote the other day on this page saying, tell me if you know somebody who's been employed under the Chips and Science Act or the Inflation Reduction Act or the American Rescue Plan um, is because there are 1.7 million of us on this particular website. Biden, as I say, I think Biden has made the mistake, the Biden people have made the mistake of trying to do everything themselves and they're not asking us to do anything. And this actually hit me the other day when Biden was doing something and I thought, Jesus, we just should help a poor guy out. Like, like he's doing this all himself. And I thought, wait a minute. It's like, the, I think I said, it's like this Lily, that Lily Tomlin line when she kept driving past something and saying somebody should do something about that. And then all of a sudden one day she went, well, I'm somebody. And that's kind of how I started to feel. It's like, well, somebody should make this message get out. And then I thought, well, I'm somebody. Literally, that's the day I did that. I thought, well, I'm somebody. I could tell this story, but you're somebody too. And this is a place where you can really get involved and say, hey, you know, look at what this administration has done for the roads or look what this administration has done for HBCUs or look what this administration has done for the economy or, you know, look at the fact that it's not able to get um, immigration legislation through Congress because the for the next year is saying it's certainly by the way the mainstream media and the legacy media is starting to be aware through people like um like uh, uh, uh frunkin who is doing press watchers and saying you know this is how you should have written that headline washington post lots of people are pushing back but there's no reason we can't speak up as well so um uh, a couple more things here that I wanted to touch really quickly. Um, uh, yes, we are looking at a government shutdown. Uh, the government runs out of money on the, uh, the 17th of November, right before Thanksgiving. And then of course, that's a huge deal, and it's a huge deal anyway. But Black Friday, which is the day after Thanksgiving, which is all about shopping, is uh, going to be severely impacted if there's a government shutdown because there is going to be, um, you know, lots of people won't get paychecks and because there's going to be a hit to the American economy that will, uh, you know, quite likely have some effect on the United States' credit rating again. And I think for me anyway, I am beyond the point where I believe that this is in any way in good faith on the Republican side. I think they are doing it to hurt Joe Biden. The idea that um, the economy, which is insanely good, and I didn't talk about inflation here and I should have, but our, our, we have recovered from the, the crisis of the pandemic better than any other nation 
and one of the ways that they can hurt that, of course, is by hurting the economy. And I think that I, I don't see how they're going to get things back on track before the 17th if they do more power to them. But Mike Johnson has zero experience doing this, and he doesn't want to compromise. And um, and I that worries me very much. That's another place to put real pressure, especially if you're in red states, on your Congress critters to say, you know, fund the expletive government. This is something that we care about. Um, another point to w look at is something I can't read. Um, well, here's a, a final thing to look at, and that is um, violence. The, the, somebody was talking about the potential upturn in violence. Really important to remember in this moment, for this next year going forward, that the reason the radical right is being as in your face and as violent and as dangerous as it is, the reason they're trying to take over um, election places, the reason they're doing everything that they're doing is because they know they are a minority. They are trying to impose minority rule on the rest of us. And I just want to sort of hearten people here and remind you that it's scary for sure, but it will be far scarier if they succeed. And one of the things, as I've said here before, that infuriates me is if there is a villain in everything that's happened in the last six years, to me, it's the Senate Republicans who could have stopped this anytime they wanted to. And now they have created a feedback loop where their voters, Republican voters, believe in Donald Trump, believe that the election was stolen because the leaders didn't speak up about it, and now the leaders don't dare speak up about it because they get attacked by the followers. And you see this, for example, recently with Chris Christie and with Asa Hutchinson, both former governors, one of New Jersey and one of Arkansas, who tried to tell the people to whom they were speaking that Trump lost the election. And they got booed, they got shouted at, they got screamed at. And in both cases, they said, you don't want to hear it, but it's the truth. And one of the things that my friends and I said early on with Trump, and if you've ever dealt with somebody like Trump, you will know it never stops until it is stopped. And if you think about where we are now, think of how much easier it would have been to stop him in 2015 than it was to stop him in 2016, than it was to stop him in 2017, and on forward. And right now, the Democrats have the Senate and they have the presidency. If we wait until 2020, you know, January 21st, 2025, it's going to be a hell of a lot, sorry, but a hell of a lot harder to turn the ship around. So we have a year here. We have a majority. We are decent people. We have history on our side. We have all the tools we need. It's just a question of getting out there and doing it. And I have faith in us. I have faith in you. And I have faith in the American experiment. So don't worry about the polls. Don't worry about anything at this point except making some friends so you're not alone and taking the time out that you need to take out if it gets to be too much, but turning out for each other as well as for Abraham Lincoln, which is who I turn out for, uh, because we really can do this. And thank you for being here. And I have to go get ready for my next gig, but, um, but we'll do this. Thanks for being here. Talk to you later.